Somebody this afternoon look like they're glad to be eating the service. Say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break. I love it too. Amen. Amen. Certainly, certainly it is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Once more and again here on this afternoon, we had a wonderful time in the Lord on this morning. We want to thank our elder and our senior minister, Brother Coffey, for that wonderful message um, that he brought us on this morning. For truly, for truly, there is no temptation that is overtaking you, but such as is coming to man, that simply means you ain't going to do nothing that nobody else went through before. <laughs> So surely we're going to all deal with that. And sure, we're going to have to have a sound faith in Jesus Christ if we expect to stand against those things that we have to face in this life. Again, happy Father's Day has been said already to all of those that are here. Amen. You took her to Longhorn on Mother's Day. You got McDonald's on Father's Day. But that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> Amen. Let us go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 41, and we'll read down to verse number 50. Again, this is a message for the fathers here on this afternoon. And prayerfully, I always want to thank those that are watching us via live stream. So glad that you tuned in to be with us here. Prayerfully, there'll be something that'll be said here on today that could be a benefit, a blessing to your life as well. Glad that you've come to Sweetwater. And if you ever get the chance, if God bless your life, do, do yourself a favor and stop by the Sweetwater Church of Christ because they tell me they got a saying around here that it's the Sweetwater Church of Christ where the gospel is preached and the water is preached. You heard it from them. You hear it from me. So come check it out for yourself. Amen. Luke chapter 8 beginning at verse number 41. And the Bible says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay there dying. But as he went through, the people thronged him, and a woman having an issue of blood for 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed by any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throne thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all people for what cause she had touched him, and how she had was immediately healed. And he said unto her daughter, Be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. And while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he said to him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Amen. Amen. For, for a short while this afternoon, I want to talk about the test of fatherhood. The test of fatherhood. He is a, a young ruler, and he got it going on, and he's winning over here, and got it big going on, everything over here, and over here, his daughter is dying. So the test that every father, and of course I'm learning this as I go along, that every father has to take at one time or another in your life is going to be a test of your priorities. When you are torn between this and that, which one are you going to go to? This is not about going to her recital. This was not about her ballet practice. This was not about choir rehearsal. All of that was wonderful. All of that was good. But he might have messed all of that up. But the girl here is dying. And she is dying for the lack of his attention. And I bring you this today because I am concerned that most men in today's culture who go to church today, most of them go to church without ever changing their priorities. They go to church, that's old school lady, they go to church, they go to church, and, and, and most men, they go to church, and, and that's what's in their heart, and they like the idea of faith, but to really sacrifice and to fully engage, there are many men in the body of Christ who have never really considered giving themselves over to Jesus. 
You have never really considered really cleaning up your act, really being a real Christian. What we got are a bunch of church people. We go to church and we don't really pray or any of that kind of stuff in our personal time. We don't really see God. We don't really read the Bible. We just go to church for whatever reason. And it gives you some, you know, it, it's cool, but, it's, it, but to really become a man of prayer, no matter how you preach, we have never really considered really seeking Jesus. A lot of people come because, you know, when I came up, mama told me I had to go to church and, you know, mama told me I had to be there by such and such a time. Make sure you get a communion. If you get a communion, you'll be all right. You'll be on your way to heaven. And a lot of us are caught up in all of that, but we have never really sold ourselves out to God and committed ourselves to do the will of God. Why is it that whenever something is going on, the women always show up first. When we have been called to be the head. When God has given us the responsibility, why is it that we lack or shrug when it comes to us really time to stand up and take our place and be who God has called us to be? So I want to ask men, those that are here and those that are watching, what will it take for God to get our attention? How many things will have to die or be taken away in our life for us to really drop down on our knees and lift up our hands and say, all to Jesus I surrender, all to Jesus I freely give. Jairus' only daughter, his only daughter, y'all, is dying. And God uses it to get him away from what he does. I'm not talking about quitting your job. I'm not talking about leaving the area that you're in. I'm not talking about that when push comes to shove, everybody around you needs to know what you're going on. But Jairus is, teaches us something here. He teaches us about patience. Because he is bringing Jesus to his daughter. Now let me tell you, speaking on behalf, and I don't know any man in here, I believe that as a father, you would do just about anything that you could do for your child. There's, there's about nothing that your child would ask for that you would not do for your child. And any person that if you are committed to anything, whether that's your family or whether it's another thing, you got to go after whatever it is that you're committed to. You have to pursue that. I don't want anything to get them out. If there's anything in your way, you're going to knock it out of the way to get to your child. If your child needs you, if your loved one needs you, or whatever the case may be. So when a man thinks something is important enough that they want help or they're serious about it, they'll reach out for it. They'll ask God to help them. But I think that a lot of times we really don't look at our cases and our issues as serious as we need to. Because a lot of times we really have some serious issues that we need to take care of, but we just look over it because, oh, it always been like that. Or, or oh, man, there ain't no need to change in that. Man, it ain't going to do no good in that. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, if it is in the way of God doing something in your life, you need to move that out of the way. If that's an environment, you need to get out of the environment. If that's people, you need to get away from those people. Whatever it is in your life that's stopping you from being all of who God wants you to be, you need to get that out of the way. So just imagine, this man got his own issues going on, brother. That he got issues. This man got his own problems that he's dealing with. And he wants Jesus to come and see about his situation. And then this woman just pop up on the scene. Who is this woman? If you are not my daughter, leave Jesus alone. I got to go. What do you do when you had a plan and somebody come along and interrupt your plan? Because we love to have a plan, don't we? We love to plan stuff. If, if you are married to a smart man, I believe every woman in here, you married to a smart man. Amen. Amen. All right, amen. He got a plan right now. Amen. He got a plan on how we're going to get the house. <laughs> Not only do we have a plan on how we're going to get the house, he got a plan on how we're going to work it out. Not only does he have a plan on how we're going to work it out, he got a plan on how he's going to pick you up and pick himself up in the transit. He got a plan on what's he going to do. He got a plan, and you mess with his plan, he's going to go crazy. This woman comes along and wrecks Jairus' plan. And Jesus wanted the plan to be right because he must pass the test of number two, and that's patience. He had to stand there 
and wait for this woman he doesn't even know to crawl across the floor and get a healing and then they got to have a debate about who touched Jesus and wait for her to come to herself and stop it and come out of the crowd and say, yeah, I did it. It was me. I test him. And now they got in a hurry. They got to get to Jesus. But he had to hold his peace. And every man, every father got to learn to be patient. Yeah. Even when your plans don't go right, guess what? You got to learn how to be patient. Listen, Jerry is teaches us about patience. He teaches us that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. He teaches us to hold our peace in the midst of a bad situation. And he teaches us how to deal with male disappointment. He teaches us what to do when who, when, we, when, when who we need to be in control in the area, and there's nothing you're saying to me that I haven't said to myself. Jared said, okay, you know I had a need. I came to you with my need. You know I came first. I don't know why. You just letting this lady show up and get you all derailed. You need to be on your way to my house. This lady, she been struggling for 12 years. She got 12 more years she can struggle. You need to be on your way to my house to do what it is that I asked you to do. And isn't that just like us sometimes? Yeah. You've been praying praying to God, asking God to open the door, asking God to move, asking God to do this. And you're looking around and everybody else getting what they want. Everybody else getting this. Everybody else getting that. You're going to have to learn how to be patient and wait on God and give God time to do what it is that he's going to do. Just imagine if Jairus would have got upset, would have got hot-headed and mad because God was attending to the need of somebody else. His daughter would still be dead. Had he not been patient, yeah. had he not been patient. So, you, you and, and not only does he teach them about patience, the third thing that Jairus teaches is about privacy. What does he teach us about privacy? He teaches us about privacy. You got too many people with you to get the job done. So God's gonna strip you of all of them people so that when he does the miracle, there's no doubt about who you should give the glory to. There's no doubt about who you should praise. There will be nobody left in the room but God and God all by himself. Now watch this. I want you to see this. When Jesus gets to the house, the mourners are there. So there's a crowd of people outside. Oh, she's dead. There's a big crowd of people outside of their mourning. But Jesus only took a few people in the room. The mother, the father, Peter, James, and John. They all go in the room, leave the mourners on the outside. That's the first separation. So Jesus said, Peter, James, and John, mom and dad, y'all can come in just a little bit closer. So they come in the room, and then there's all this mourning. And Jesus said, she sleep. They start laughing. Mm -hmm. And their laugh canceled out their opportunity to be in the room. Because sometimes, because anytime you think God is joking, <laughs> anytime you think that God is playing around, I don't know about y'all, but I serve a God that if he makes a promise, he's going to come through on his promise. If God says a word, he's going to fulfill that very word that it is that he has said. And anytime you believe what you see more than you believe God, you're in trouble, church. Because faith is the what? Substance of things that we hope for and it is the evidence of things that we cannot see. This is a classic case of God wanting to do something in somebody's life who could not handle it. He brought them in a room. He had to put them out of. Do you have enough faith, church, today to stay in the room? Or do you have to stay on the outside? Do you have enough faith to believe the report of the Lord? Or are you so focused on what everybody else is saying? Do you have enough faith to stand on the promises of God? Or are you just pushed and tossed by every wave, by every wind that comes along in your life? He not only taught them about patience, but he taught them about privacy. And I want to tell you, church, you got to stop trying to take everybody with you. Yes. Come on now. We got to stop including everybody in what we got going on. If you got something going on in your life, everybody on your Facebook page don't need to know about it. 
If you got something going on in your life, Snapchat might not need a video about it. Because you may think everybody loves you and everybody praying for you. There's some people out there smiling in your face just hoping you trip, just hoping you fall, just hoping you stumble. And you put all that stuff out there and everybody don't care about what's going on. Amen. And we got to learn that there are certain things in your life you ain't got to go out and bring nobody else in. Some things, it just needs to be you and God. Because when you bring all of these other people in, this person bringing in this conversation, that person bringing in that conversation, and as a child of God, sometimes, especially when you're in the middle of a situation, you can get confused. Your faith can waver. You can begin to doubt because you got all of this stuff going on around you, but it ain't nobody but you and God. When you keep your mind on God, when you keep your mind on his word, he said, I keep thee in what? Perfect peace. If you just keep your mind stayed on me. I know what it looked like, but I want you to keep your mind stayed on me. I know what everybody else is saying, but I want you to keep your mind stayed on me. And if you keep your mind stayed on me, I give you peace that just don't make no sense. So, with no witnesses, God reveals his power. With no witnesses, because y'all know he's still powerful with nobody around. Because when he was just God out there, nobody but God, he was still God all by himself. When there was nobody around to say, oh, you're holy. When there was nobody around to say, oh, you're wonderful. Oh, you're majestic, you're glory. He was still God all by himself. Amen. Now think about this for just a moment. How many times have you prayed for a healing and got healed but don't know when? <laughs> How many times have you prayed for God to do something, for God to hear you? God did it, but you don't know when. Mm -hmm. How many times have you prayed for things to get better and it got better, but you don't know when it got better? Mm -hmm. You just looked around and said, oh, it's better. I'm feeling better today. She's acting better today. The kids are doing better because God does not need your input to display his power. God does not need you to sign off on anything for him to be God in your life. When God gets ready to do something, when God gets ready to bring his people out, he can bring you out without one witness being around. He can bring you out so fast, you don't even matter, you get whiplash. You didn't even know you came out. That's just how quick God will work if you give God the opportunity. Amen. He's so powerful. So powerful. Thank you, Lord. So mighty. There is nothing that you are dealing with, nothing you are struggling with that God cannot handle, that God cannot deal with it. The only thing that you need to do is let him have it. Amen. Give it over to him. I wonder how many of us right now are sitting here worried, weighed down, struggling with things that we ain't got no power to change. But all you need to do is just give it over to God. I'm sure that woman had made up in her mind, man, I done gave you money. I done went over here and seen that doctor. I done went over here and seen that doctor. I done went and seen everybody else. I'm going to give Jesus a try. I'm going to let Jesus help me with this issue that I got going on. And the very moment that she decided to trust Jesus with her situation, it didn't take a two week recovery time yes, yes. Amen. they didn't have to send her to rehab nope. she didn't have to go to no home the bible says that immediately yes, the yes. issue of blood that was in her body stopped and I don't care what we are dealing with this morning you got issues in your life if you say you ain't got it your issue is lying we all got issues that we are dealing with and whatever it is that you are dealing with stop trying to handle it by yourself say lord I cannot do it. Lord, it's in your hand. Lord, I want you to tell me that because if I keep messing with it, I lose my mind. I end up losing my faith. I end up saying stuff I don't need to say, doing stuff I don't need to do. So, Lord, I'm going to let you have it. I'm going to let you deal with it. How many of y'all ever tried to change somebody and end up losing yourself? Just to realize that you couldn't change nobody. Only God can change an individual. God is omniscient. When we say that he is omniscient, it means that he knows all things. Mm -hmm. There is not a bird that falls out of the tree and hits the ground mm -hmm. that God doesn't know exactly which bird. Yeah, that's right. God knows when that bird was born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God knows exactly what two birds made that bird. Thank you, Lord. 
God knows exactly the area that that thing resides. That's just what kind of power God has. So Jarius, if he has that kind of power, if he wait a month to come to your house, if he waits a year before he comes to your house, your daughter will still arise. That's just the kind of power that he has. And I know maybe there are us in here today. We've been dealing with issues, and a lot of us got long-standing issues that we've been dealing with. Whenever God gets ready to show up, let me tell you, it ain't going to be too late. You might think it's too late because you got a time period on when it needs to be over and when it needs to end. But whenever God shows up, whenever God decides to do it, it's going to get done. I'm sure Mary and Martha would have liked for Jesus to show up before Lazarus started stinking. I'm sure they would have liked that. I'm sure they would have wanted Jesus when we sent word to you the first time you should have came and seen about our brother. He's not just our brother, but you love him, Jesus. You've been in our house. You ate my beans. You ate my green. You ate everything. You, you, we, we got fellowship with one another. How you going to do us like that? But Jesus knew. If I go today, if I go a month from now, if I wait a whole year, my power is still the same. God's power, church, does not have an expiration date on it. Whenever God gets ready to do something, he can do it just like he said that he would. Amen. Yes. Amen. This man of high position, he was not just a Johnny come lately. He was not a nobody. He was somebody. People looked up to him in the community that he lived in. This man, out of all the position, all of the splendor that he had, had an issue that he couldn't fix. And you know, sometimes no matter how strong we think we are, no matter how good we think we are in certain areas of our life, we boil down to the fact that sometimes there are just certain things we can't fix. Every single individual in here I'm sure has felt the pain of losing a loved one. Oh, yeah. If you could do anything to change it, you would. Yes. But you recognize you can't do anything about it. And instead of allowing yourself to be covered by the, 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 the problem not being able to fix it and the loss that you are facing, you've learned to bring your cares to Jesus. You've learned to give that worry, that stress over to him. And he's given you, as Paul said, the grace to be able to handle it. The grace to be able to deal with it. And I believe that every man is going to be dependent, is dependent upon the grace of God. Not only every man, every woman is dependent upon the grace of God. Because even though we think we're always right, we ain't always right. Even though we think we always know what's best, we don't always know what's best. Even though we think we always got the answer, we don't always have the answer. And a lot of times, we're going to be tested in the area of our pride. That's, a, that's our problem with a lot of us. We're too prideful to admit that we're wrong. We're too prideful to tell somebody that we're sorry. Yes. We're too prideful to go back and mend relationships that we know we messed up. Amen. We're too prideful to do anything. But let me tell you, God will bring situations into your life that no matter how hard and callous your heart may be, God knows just how to break you down. God knows. God, this man, this ruler, this man, he can't make you. My daughter is sick. I can't do anything about it. Jesus, I need you to come to my house. Why didn't he go to a doctor? Because they couldn't do anything about it. I need Jesus to go to my house. I don't need a physician. I don't need a nurse. I need Jesus to come to my house. And when he came, he did exactly what it was that they were expecting him to do. But that man was tested. That man experienced tests that nobody in here wants to experience. Not only are you waiting for him to come, you were, you already came. Jesus, I need you to come to my house. And we already got it. Doors open, food ready. We just need you to stop by. 
and you just caught up in this conversation with this woman and she bringing her issues and, and now she done brought her issue and somebody touched you and now you gotta do an investigation, go around, who, did you touch him? Did you touch him? Who did you, did you, did you touch him? Who touched him? Somebody touched me. Now you gotta do all of that and I'm just sitting over here waiting on my blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My daughter's still sick. She's still laying there down. You still ain't came. You know where she at? I gave you the address. She, you, 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 know, you know how to get there. And I'm over here waiting. Do you not see what I'm going through? Do you not see what I'm dealing with? And I think we've all had that moment in our life. Where it seems like the devil has called off the little imps and called out the big dogs. Where it seems like everybody else is just skating through life just easy and everything is just so nice. And every day we're facing more and more trials. More and more temptation, more and more battles that we have to fight. Knowing that all of that is perfecting your faith. Knowing that all of that is building you up to be the person that God has called you to be. So we are going to be tested. Amen. Your patience is going to be tested. Amen. You are going to have to learn as a man and as a woman to be who God has called you to be. Yeah. Stop trying to live up to the expectations of people because people will set expectations for you that they themselves cannot stand up to. Be who God has called you to be. Live the life that God has called for you to live. If God has blessed you and you're here, so you're in some kind of reason portion of health and strength. You, 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 I, I'm wrecking you in your right mind. Your mind might go bad sometimes, but I'm wrecking you in your right mind. If God has blessed you like that, you ought to want to devote yourself to him. And any man, I can say the greatest thing that any man can do is save your family. That's the greatest thing that any man can do. It's not only say it, but to be an example for your family. To be somebody that they can look to. To be somebody that, hey, they can come to you when they have questions about their faith and their spirituality. That they can come to you and they can ask you these questions and trust that you are going to give them the answer that they need. But in so many areas, we know it. I know for myself. I know about the church and came up in the church not because of a man. My grandma. And my mother. And, and, and other women in my life that play such significant roles that have me in the place that I am right now. Men, we need to rise up yes. and be who God has called us to be. God has not called you to sit in the pew. God has called you to stand up and do some work. God has called us to get busy in the kingdom of God. That is what he has called us to do. Don't send your kids to church and with the mama. And you stay at the house and going fishing. I want to go fishing. I go another day. <laughs> and all these other things be the example Amen. that our families can follow after. Temptations will come. Trials will come. You're not going to always get it right. You're not going to always do everything that you're supposed to. You're not going to always say the right things. But guess what? I believe it's a learning process, Elder this. I believe it's a learning process. I believe you said it this morning. When, your ch when a child comes out, there's not a manual tied to their leg. Okay, this is what you do, this is what you do. In this situation, this is how you handle this. When they cry, you do this. When they do this, you know. It's a learning process that we all have to go through. And whenever you fail, take that as a lesson learned. To whatever caused me to fail in this area next time. I'm not going to succumb to that, but I'm going to do better. And hold ourselves accountable when we don't do what God has called us to do. Because we got a whooping waiting on us if we don't do what God has called for us to do. That's going to be some blood on our hand if we don't do what it is that God has called for us to do. So men, just take our place, arise, and be who God has called us to be. My brother, my sister, maybe you're here today. And you're standing in the need of prayer. I believe that's all of us. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my sister, not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. I want to offer a prayer even today for all of the men that are watching us. All of the men that are members here of this church. That God will give us the strength to be all of who we need to be as husbands. As fathers. As sons. As brothers. In whatever aspect that we're in. Give us 
a sense of responsibility. Make us accountable. Make us want to do the will and the work of the Lord. Maybe you're here today. You're standing in the need of prayer. The Bible still says that the prayers of the righteous, they availeth much. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching us via live stream. And you're not yet a member of the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. You come by hearing his word, Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. So then, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you've heard the word, you believe the same. And after belief, repent of your sins, confess Christ as your Savior, be buried with him in baptism, have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to rise before you in this life, and neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body, praising God and having faith with all the people the Lord has to the church daily, such as should be saved. Maybe you're here today, you're subject to the invitation, we beckon, we plead, why not? Come to Jesus as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Thank you.